Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Marta, I'm from TU Delft Library and I'm really glad that so many of you are able to come today to our Future Forward seminar. Today we'll be talking about replication studies and importance of them and the opening remarks will be done by Karlin Hillebrink from NVO who is the policy advisor at NVO and she will tell us about why it's important for NVO to fund such studies and also what are the principles behind replication studies. Afterwards, we will hear a talk from Joost, who is one of our data champions in TU Delft, and he will tell us about his story and his take. He's actually doing replication studies research, and he will tell us a little bit more about this. And afterwards, Hans, who is the head of department where Joost is based, will be chairing the question and answers. And of course, afterwards, we will have drinks. So welcome, Caroline. I think I have. Oh, yeah. what um, I just doesn't go very well with my glasses. So let's see if they stay on. Look. Um, so my name is Carlene Hillebrink. I'm policy advisor at the Social Sciences and Humanities Department um, of NVL, and I'm running the Replication Studies program, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, so we set it up. Uh, it's a program to fund specifically um, replication studies, surprising enough. Um, it was all started by a blog post by Daniel Lakens. He's a sociologi uh, psychologist in Eindhoven. And he pointed out that in the current funding uh, opportunities of NWO, um, replication studies are hard to get funding for because in most of our calls um, innovation is, is one of the assessment criteria and it can be difficult to argue that for a replication. Um, and my boss thought, yes, yes, Daniel, you have a point. So we went to talk to him and a couple of other researchers also working on replications. Um, and that uh, eventually an, uh, resulted in a program. So the aim of it is specifically to support uh, researchers who want to do replication studies um, because they're an important part of the scientific method. Um, and there was, of course, um, ample evidence that um, there was a bit, there was a need for, for replications. Um, we just had the replication crisis uh, in social psychology and there's also evidence from other fields. Um, and in um, we, we wanted, so the, the first aim was to, to support people um, doing replication studies and to um, give them uh, the funds to do so. Um, but our second aim was um, to see how we might be able to fund them as a regular part of, of our uh, funding instruments. Um, because they're a little bit different. It's not just uh, the innovation thing that is different. You have to look at methods, um, perhaps a little more thoroughly at some points. Um, and so we wanted to just uh, try it out for a couple of rounds and, and see what we learn in order to implement it um, more structurally if we can. Um, so we started thinking about the setup um, and one of the things was of course which studies need to be replicated. You can make a long list and um, consult everyone and then let people um, apply for that. Uh, we went the other way around so we ask um, researchers to explain why the study they want to replicate is important. For this we use the term cornerstone. Uh, research we particularly want to fund replications of studies that um, get taught in every, in every textbook that a lot of future uh, further work in the field builds on um, that has influenced policy or uh, treatment uh, guidelines, um, surgery techniques. Um, so it's up to the applicants to show okay that's why it's this is the reason why it's important to replicate this particular study. Um, now, the, there is a fair bit of discussion about what a replication is and is not. Um, we use this uh, three-way division to separate them. So the first one is usually called uh, a reproduction. So you take the original data and you repeat the same analysis and you see what, um, what comes out. Um, the second type is a replication with new data. So you take the same research questions, same protocol, but you uh, collect new data, um, usually with um, a better power than the original study, because that's often where, where the questions come from. 
Um, and type 3 is uh, conceptual replication, uh, as people sometimes call it, so that's where you really take things a step further. Um, and this is a type we exclude for a program because this is the kind of research where an effect has been shown in babies and you're going to see if it also occurs in teenagers. Um, so to really take the next step in, in, uh, in research and we feel that that generally has, um, doesn't, isn't at a disadvantage in our usual programs. So we only fund the first two. The line between type 2 and type 3 can be a bit hazy. Um, that's why we let uh, the assessment committee decide. Um, so, so far, um, we've concluded two rounds. We have funding, as I said, for three. We um, funded three pro uh, nine projects in the first call, eight in the second, um, and we've just had the deadline um, for the third call. For the first two calls, we funded, um, they were open for submission from the social sciences and also, also from health and medical research, so our neighbors at uh, Zonneme. And for the third call, we've included um, the humanities. Um, and their replication can be a slightly different thing, um, which there, there's some um, discussion about that. And of course, for things like social economic history and, and large parts of linguistics, it's, um, it's very, very easy to, to see that it, it fits in with our, our program very easily. Uh, what we have excluded um, is things that work with interpretation as a method, people who look at a text and study it, um, because then if the replication shows something different, it's very easy to wonder um, whether that's maybe just down to the fact that it was done by a different person. We try to avoid that discussion as much as possible. Um, so in March we'll be done with the third call um, and then we start evaluating, of course. Um, we've evaluated every round, um, mostly for the purpose of improving the next one. The three rounds have been quite, quite different. Um, and, but most importantly, we'll evaluate the program. Um, so most of all, we want to learn um, from the researchers who've been funded um, what, they've, what it's been like to carry out um, these replication studies. Um, but also we want to learn, we want to study very closely what we have learned about funding replications, how you assess them properly, what you have to ask in an application form, all those kinds of practical things, um, so that we can talk properly about um, the future of uh, funding replication studies. So what we're going to do as a next step uh, remains to be seen, but uh, one of the things we're looking at is very much mainstreaming it in our open competition, uh, for instance. Um, there is more information on our website, which can be a little difficult to transfer. So, but if you go to Google, you type in NVO and replication studies, it, uh, it, it leads you to that page, so that's very useful. And you can email me or uh, my colleague uh, Guillaume Macor at our medical sister organization. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. We'll leave the questions for the very end. Um, now I'd like to welcome Jost, Jost de Winter from the faculty from the Department of Cognitive Robotics who will tell us about his exciting study. You probably know better. Yeah. All right. Yeah, really uh, excited to be here. Um, the title of this talk is, Can I really read your emotions if I look deeply into your eyes? Uh, so that's what I will be talking about today. A bit of an um, overview, uh, so first I'll try to uh, give a bit of background, like why are we as at a technical university doing replication research? What was the incentive for applying uh, the, for this grant? Second, a bit of theory, uh, why do we think or I think uh, that some research, uh, research fails to replicate? Why do we have false positives in the literature? Um, then at the third point I will uh, give some progress uh, in our current project. Uh, so we are, the project is already ongoing for one and a half years. Uh, we haven't published a paper yet, uh, but uh, I will show the first results today, actually. So it's also an opportunity for us to get some feedback from the audience and maybe strengthen our, uh, our writings. And finally, I'll end with some concluding remarks and maybe give some uh, recommendations. So why are we doing replication research? Well, to give a bit of background, uh, in our section, we're really looking a lot at uh, assessing uh, drivers. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a driving simulator study. 
And so this participant is hooked up with sensors, accelerometers, eye trackers, there was ECG measurement, uh, reading frequency measurement, and so forth. Uh, and we wanted to understand, uh, can, we, or can, the, can the car actually, by means of measurements, understand the state of the driver? Uh, if we know whether this driver is stressed or something, uh, we could maybe uh, give feedback to the driver in real time and help the driver, uh, so be create a better human-machine system. Uh, so in this experiment, uh, there were uh, over 50 people. They had to drive to a virtual airport, uh, once uh, normally and once in a sort of stress condition. Uh, so there was a virtual driver saying, you have to hurry up, there was a timer, and so on. Uh, so we measured all these signals in these two different conditions. Well, here you see some results. Uh, so these are like the objective results, like the speed of the car, the lateral position of the car, and so forth. Uh, so what you see, these are averages across the 50 uh, people. Uh, that of course, you uh, drive a bit faster in a time pressure condition, and we find all kinds of interesting effects, uh, more like strategic effects. Sometimes people break a bit less hard when they're under pressure, sometimes they break a bit harder. Uh, this can be all explained from a control perspective, uh, but we also see some subtle phenomena. For example, here, um, the driver's actually slower uh, because he's stuck behind another car. The drivers are stuck behind another car, so they cannot overtake, and there, therefore the speed is slower. And so if you just look at speed and, and lateral position, it's a bit hard to infer whether the driver was stressed or not. Uh, so we reasoned that's why we should look at all these physiological signals. Uh, the top figure, uh, this is uh, as a function of the travel distance in the route, I should, should, uh, should mention, just things like horizontal gaze variance. How much is the driver looking around? Uh, at certain points, he starts scanning left and right. Second one, pupil diameter, which I'll be talking about today, um, <coughs> uh, gives some interesting patterns. Also, breathing frequency and heart rate. Uh, so they have different dynamics. The heart rate reacts a bit slowly. Pupil reacts very fast to certain changes. <coughs> so one thing we did find is that the pupil diameter was a bit higher in the time pressure condition. Um, well, statistically, it was actually, if you look within subjects, quite a strong effect. But on an absolute scale, it's not much of a strong effect. Eh? You also see all kinds of other fluctuations, uh, um, <coughs> which can have all kinds of uh, causes. Uh, for example, if you're stuck behind a dark car, uh, the pupils might dilate simply because it's darker, right? So there can be all kinds of artifacts uh, in the signal. So we thought, wow, statistically, it's really powerful, but it's also really hard to, to read somebody's state from pupil diameter. Um, well, we started to looking further into the literature, and there it's, it's indeed proven, uh, apart from the light reflex, which we all know, that things like stress or cognition, uh, thinking hard, workload, can inde indeed dilate the pupil with about half a millimeter. Um, well, there are actually quite some studies about this. For example, this study from the 1970s, um, it shows that if people have to do difficult calculations, uh, their pupil diameter dilates. For easy calculations, the pupil diameter is, uh, dilates a bit less. Uh, so we thought, wow, interesting. If it's really this powerful, maybe, yeah, although it's uh, very difficult, we could use the pupil diameter in a driver state assessment. So actually, quite some years ago, before the replication project, we already did a replication of this research in order to better understand how we could measure pupil diameter. Uh, so this was the setup. Uh, basically, people had to look at a screen and we presented equations and uh, multiplications. And in this screen, there's a there are cameras which measure where you're looking and also the pupil diameter we uh, <coughs> inferred from the data. Uh, so this is a bit how the experiment looked like. 15 times 6. That's the easy one. Who knows an answer? <laughs> All right, that's uh, perhaps easy. Now we go to a more difficult one. Fourteen times sixteen. Who's first? Two hundred twenty-four. Uh, very good house. <laughs> um, <coughs> right. So clearly, you can already recognize some difficulties here. There are individual differences. Also, yeah, we actually made a sort of grayscale to compensate for any luminance effect. So this was actually quite an effort to get this right. Uh, but if we then look at the results, these are again averages of uh, about 35 participants who all did multiple trials, and you get these nice looking graphs where indeed we replicated the previous research. Uh, so for the difficult calculations, the, the uh, yellow line, pupil dilation was larger compared to the easy calculations. So we thought, wow, this is maybe uh, still something, although we recognize the difficulty. Uh, you get these nice graphs only after averaging. If you look at individual trials, it's uh, <laughs> quite noisy actually. 
So this was a useful step forward, but we uh, still were puzzled with the literature, because if you look at the literature, uh, many researchers use pupil diameter for all kinds of things. Uh, um, things like valence, do we find something positive or negative? Or interest, do we find something interesting or not? Or communication, uh, so there's this whole theory that says, well, if, if you're talking to somebody and uh, the pupil diameter of the person who you're talking to gets larger, then your own pupil diameter also gets larger. Uh, so there are all kinds of theories in the literature which can, to a large extent, be traced back to this person, Eckhart Hess, who published uh, a number of papers, usually with a very small number of participants, I should mention, in the 60s and 70s on all these topics. Uh, so these, these works are quite highly cited. Here you see one example of a study which is uh, cited over 700 times. Uh, so Hess said in 1960, well, uh, for example, this was about interest, uh, if uh, males look at a picture of a nude female, uh, their pupil starts to dilate. If females look at a baby, their pupils, pupil starts to dilate, right? So we thought, wow, these are really strong effects, 20%, highly cited. But yeah, it was hard to uh, reconcile with these results where we knew how difficult it was to really get yeah, good, good data. Uh, so this was actually the reason why we applied for this grant. We wanted to understand the work of Hess better, especially the 1960 publication, which had such a large, uh, large impact. So we wrote the proposal, so here you see the people involved, they're also in the, in the room. Uh, so we have uh, Bastian, uh, Dimitra, co-applicant, and, and Lars. Uh, yeah, Bastian had quite a large role in the project, he was actually postdoc. Uh, so we, we chose experienced researchers because we thought it would be really difficult to get all these things right. Uh, you have to, we have to do lots of reading, uh, lots of archival work. Uh, so I think that was a good choice to, to go for relatively uh, experienced researchers. <coughs> So having taught this, I'll give the results of this replication product in a bit. Why does some research fail to replicate? Well, this is how I would like to formulate it. There might, of course, be different uh, views on this. Um, yeah, but this is a um, so-called hierarchy of sciences. It was created in the 19th century by, by Comte. And he says that so sociology, uh, or how humans interact, how humans behave, is at the top of this hierarchy. Uh, it's very context-dependent. And these phenomena depend to a large extent on bio biological processes, which in turn depend on chemical processes, physical relations, and on, on the bottom we have mathematics, you know, which applies everywhere, you could say. Um, <coughs> so the reason uh, is also the fact that human behavior is actually very complex, and researchers often use statistics to arrive at certain conclusions. Uh, so suppose I would ask you, do you like uh, candy on a scale from one to five, right? Maybe you can give a number. Eight. <laughs> uh, you can also get like faulty data, that's very true. But, don't <laughs> uh, but if I ask you tomorrow, you might give a slightly different number. And if I ask you, you might again get a different number. Uh, so uh, things are not generalizable, they're very context dependent. So researchers, especially in behavioral research, rely quite often on statistics. Uh, so things such as a p-value, uh, I looked into this myself, are, uh, in, for example, the medical field and behavioral sciences used 60 times more often compared to, for example, in the physical sciences or in engineering. Well, uh, I don't know if you know the TV series uh, Kijken in the Zoo. Um, who can speak Dutch here, by the way? I think we have not a majority, so I, I will show it anyway and I'll give a short clarification. What afterwards. you see by the social wetenschappen, natuurlijk dat ze, uh, en dat vergeten we gauw, met een, een, ja, zich toch uh, begeven in een vakgebied van een enorme complexiteit. En mensen denken van ja, natuurkunde is ingewikkeld, maar die elementaire deeltjes is eigenlijk heel erg eenvoudig. En we zien dat, uh, ik vroeg van, van ja, want het is een beetje meer als het leggen van een puzzel. Mm -hmm. Uh, dan begin ik in ieder geval altijd aan de rand, want het zijn de makkelijkste steentjes. Uh, dus, uh, dat is waar, het, waar het, uh, de, de wereld simpel wordt. Dus je ziet vaak de, de vakgebieden waar we uh, veel vooruitgang hebben geboekt. En waarbij die normen heel scherp kunnen worden gehandhaafd. En bij spreken de deeltjes fysica doen we een miljard experimenten per seconde. En dan jarenlang, en dan heb je natuurlijk geweldige hoeveelheid data. Maar dat komt omdat steeds maar een paar deeltjes tegen elkaar aanbod zijn. Maar u gaat toch niet zeggen dat u een veel eenvoudiger vak hebt dan de sociale psychologie? In zekere zin wel, denk ik. Wel? Ja, ja, ik denk dat, uh, dat het begrip van uh, een kwark of een elektron ja. een stuk eenvoudiger is dan van de mens. En vooral van de psyche van de mens en hoe mensen met elkaar interageren. Ja, so he shows, of course, some false modesty. It's not true that it's more difficult. But yeah, he has a point, right? Uh, uh, there's quite some complexity involved. 
And yeah, you made also the remark that um, yeah, actually there was also a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Eugene Wigner in physics, who said, actually I'm lucky because an electron is everywhere the same, right? So in a sense, that's a lucky aspect. While humans are always different, it's very context dependent. So there, there's a need often to use statistics, right? So how do researchers in the behavioral scientists tend to use statistics? Well, typically it goes as follows. Yeah, so suppose you want to test a certain hypothesis. Um, you want to check whether this coin is fair. Well, what do you do? You might toss it a number of times. Suppose you toss it 30 times. Well, you might want to say, well, why don't toss it a billion times? Well, you usually have a nim num limited number of resources, right? It's impossible to test a billion participants, for example. And so let's suppose we, we do this 30 times. And we find 21 heads and 9 tails. Well, that's a quite plausible finding. Uh, so what researchers usually do is to say, yeah, suppose that the coin is fair, uh, then I would expect on average uh, 15 times heads, 50 times tails. Uh, so this is the distribution you might expect if you have a fair coin. And 21 is indeed quite rare. Uh, so there's only a 2.1% chance that you find 21 heads or more. Uh, so you could argue, well, this is quite coincidental. The p-value is smaller than 0 0.05, which is usually used. So I call my results statistically significant. Uh, I can conclude this coin is biased by my uh, observations. Um, yeah, so given a certain null hypothesis, our observation is quite unlikely. Well, this is how it usually goes. However, is this really the right way of assessing things? Well, let's use a similar example. Uh, suppose you go to the casino uh, for the first time and you have a bit of bad luck. So two times in a row, you score the green pocket, you lose all your money to the bank. Well, you could argue, well, the probability is really small. It's one uh, divided by 37 square, uh, one divided by 1,369. It's definitely smaller than 0 0.05. So you could conclude, well, the roulette table is biased, right? The casino is fraudulent. You could get your lawyer out and make all kinds of stories in the casino. Well, a more reasonable approach could be, maybe I just had bad luck. Yeah, so uh, there's this saying, this is from Carl Sagan, but others have used it as well. He used it in the context of UFOs. But he said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, so a single significant p-value doesn't mean that your null hypothesis is false. Yeah, so it's, it really depends also on the prior knowledge. How likely is it that a certain hypothesis is, is true or false beforehand? Yeah, so if we go back to this coin tossing example, if you do it again and I give you some prior knowledge, I say, no, a fair coin is not 50-50, but an, an unfair coin is actually two heads. Well, if you then find 21 heads, the same result, it must mean that the coin is fair, right? Because you found nine tails, so it can never be the unfair coin. Uh, so depending on your prior knowledge, you can reach exactly opposite conclusions. Um, so this is a bit of the, the framework that I would like to give. Um, you might have heard of this article. Uh, it's very well known in the behavioral sciences. Um, it's, I think, cited uh, 7,000 uh, 7, times. And in this work, uh, John Ioannidis, which has uh, become almost a classical work, he says, most published research findings are false. So what he actually says, um, well, I looked into this article myself as well, uh, and I found if I did, uh, re redid all the calculations, there's a mistake in one of his tables. So there's like a parenthesis missing. But I'm not talking about these kinds of uh, small uh, mistakes, so to speak. I'm really talking about big mistakes, right? Type 1 errors. So the researcher says, well, I have a significant effect, but it's just not true. If you would do it again with an infinite number of samples, uh, sample size, you would just not get the same result. Uh, so he says more than 50% of the papers which says p is smaller than 0 0.05 are actually false. Well, he does this by means of various calculations, and he actually argues that there are three factors that determine the probability or likelihood that a positive research finding is false. Uh, the first factor he calls the R-value. Uh, so that can be defined as the ratio of true to no relationships in the field. So what it means, uh, if the R would be 50-50, uh, uh, then before doing the research, it would be like a 50% chance of your hypothesis being true. If we as engineers would uh, replicate Newton's laws, for example, well, we can be pretty confident that we get quite an accurate uh, replication. Uh, but if you would like to do research in uh, obscure topics like uh, clairvoyance, for example, uh, there has been research 
uh, which actually argues that people can predict the numbers of a random number generator, for example, uh, pre precognition that's called, ridiculous work, <laughs> then in, in such case, uh, any significant p-value, any p is smaller than 0 0.05, must be a false positive. Uh, so he says this r-value um, yeah, is very important, <coughs> and it might be also field-dependent. Well, the second factor, he says, is statistical power. Uh, statistical power means something like, suppose the hypothesis is true, what is the probability that the researcher concludes it's true? Uh, so that relates to the sensitivity of your statistical test, and power is usually higher when the sample size is higher, or if the effect which you're looking for is stronger. Uh, so if you have higher power, um, yeah, you're more likely to come up with true positives. Uh, so this is uh, a type 2 error. Uh, so 1 minus a two type 2 error rate is defined as statistical power. Uh, so what this means is that, yeah, suppose your power is low, uh, there will be less true positives in the literature, and false positives will be relatively more prevalent. Uh, so he says that's the second factor. The third factor is bias. Um, well, I came across this uh, news article. It says after four weeks, uh, the appearance of lines and wrinkles is reduced by up to 50%. Wow. I looked further, and there was actually an article with that, <laughs> uh, also some commentary articles. Uh, and these commentaries actually discussed various potential sources of bias. So what is bias? Bias relates to the fact that researchers generally like significant results, right? Um, yeah, they like p is smaller than 0, 0 0.05. Um, that's a better story usually than a, a non-significant effect. Uh, so what could be a bias here? For example, after the online publication, they added this note that the research was funded by Allianz Boots, which I think is a manufacturer of this product. Uh, there are other things. Uh, this is a randomized controlled trial. It's actually a sort of gold standard. It was not really a randomized controlled trial. It was a trial which actually had more flexibility. Also, uh, if you talk about uh, measuring lines and wrinkles on your skin, there are all kinds of ways to measure that. Uh, roughness of the skin, you can look at photos, uh, actually five different ways. Um, uh, pigment, and you're going to work with skin analysis and so on. You can do this also at different periods, after six months, after 12 months. Uh, so if you read the paper, they didn't really pre-specify like what are we going to look at. It seemed like they looked for the, or they, they presented the uh, most significant effect and they brought them forward in their story. Uh, so these are ex uh, examples of bias. Uh, so Ioannidis, in his work, uses these three parameters, the R-value, statistical power, and bias uh, in his model uh, to categorize different types of research. Uh, so the PPV is the positive predictive value. It actually indicates, well, suppose we have a significant effect, what's the probability that it's indeed true in that research field with that specific research design? Uh, so I will go a bit, bit quickly through this slide, but he says, well, if you have like a randomized controlled trial, uh, that's uh, sort of the best type of research, double blind and so on, uh, you have a good R value, so the hypothesis could indeed quite well be true, good power, um, uh, then the PPV is uh, high, 85%. Uh, as a worst possible case, uh, suppose you have a big data set, um, and you're going to explore the data set for some significant effects, uh, then the PPV uh, is actually very low. Uh, and he said, well, in genetics research, not today, but maybe some decades ago when the field was in, the, uh, in its infancy, so I'm talking about molecular genetics, uh, this was indeed uh, the case. Uh, so he says, well, most research is around here. So we have like these small experiments, not really high power, there could be quite some bias. Uh, the hypothesis is not really plausible, maybe 1 in 10. Uh, so in these kind of cases, um, yeah, your PPV could well be below 50%. So that's what he's saying in his work. And I think he has been proven right, so this was published in 2005. There have been some replication uh, attempts where large numbers of studies have been replicated, indeed around 50% uh, seems to replicate in uh, certain research fields. Well, I'd like to give a few examples of um, yeah, inflated effects or false positives. Well, this is about fMRI research. Uh, so fMRI is a brain imaging technique. What is sometimes done is that the, the blood uh, flow in the brain uh, in a certain region of the brain is correlated with uh, scores on a personality test, in this case BIS, behavioral inhibition score. What it actually says is that people who have higher brain activity in a certain region uh, also score more highly on this test. Well, um, if you think more carefully, this is quite a strong correlation of about 0 0.9. Uh, such correlations are not even possible because we know how noisy 
uh, these types of measurements are, and we also uh, statistically how noisy personality tests are, right? So maybe uh, you would not never expect a correlation higher than 0 0.7 if you would do an, use an infinite number of, of subjects. Uh, so there was a researcher already some years ago who thought, how did these researchers actually assess uh, the correlation? Uh, the problem is with fMRI, you have, uh, it's, it has a very high spatial resolution, uh, so you can select all kinds of regions in the brain. Uh, so which, which one are you going to use, right? Did you pre-specify that beforehand, or are you looking a bit what, what, which brain region gives the strongest effect and take an average of that? Uh, so all fMRI researchers compensate somewhat for it, but he looked into what he did is he sent emails to papers uh, reporting these kinds of correlations, and he asked, well, did you use the independent method, uh, how it should be, or did you use the non-independent, more exploratory method? And he indeed found, uh, based on the answers to those emails, the people who admitted using the more exploratory method also reported somewhat stronger correlations uh, in their papers. Well, this is about biomarkers. I think it's also relevant for the research department, biomechanical engineering. Uh, so bio, uh, biomarkers actually a biological property of a human, for example, a presence of a hormone or genetic variant, which is um, supposedly predictive of like disease or prognosis. Uh, so usually a biomarker is like discovered, right? It's discovered and then it's published and it receives lots of citations. Maybe a few years later, uh, other research teams start to replicate uh, that finding with larger samples. So in this uh, graph, you see the relative risk. So basically how strongly predictive is this biomarker for the most highly cited study, usually the first one, and for the largest study. Uh, what we see here is that the first study usually attracts lots of citations and that the effect is actually considerably smaller in the replication study. It might still be there, but it's smaller. Well, this is about, this is a, a quite extreme example, which I picked up from the, from the re recent literature, 2018. This is about antidepressants. Um, <coughs> so in the United States, um, uh, all trials into antidepressants have to be uh, registered at the FDA. Yeah? So if you don't do that, you will not get approval for your drugs and you cannot sell it, sell it. So all these studies are registered. But there was one researcher who uh, went to the FDA, got all uh, results, and he found that there were 105 trials uh, and about 50% gave a positive result for the antidepressant and 50% a negative result. Uh, so these are present at the FDA, they're not necessarily published. Uh, so he looked how much of these findings are actually published. Uh, it turns out that uh, yeah, the positive trials are much more likely to be published compared to the negative trials. This is publication bias. Um, it turns also out also that uh, there was the bias I just mentioned. Uh, so people in, apparently in their articles um, yeah, presented a negative finding still as positive. So how can you do that? Uh, for sometimes there are multiple findings and you could present uh, like this, you could, for example, switch the primary and secondary finding, and so it appears that your primary finding is still positive. Um, well, furthermore, there was spin, so what does, what does that mean? Um, well, you could, for example, suppose the p-value is not significant, p is 0 0.10, you could still give a sort of positive story to it, like there was a trend or something like that. Huh? So that also occurred. And final step, the positive trials also received much more citations many more citations than the negative trials. And so if you as a researcher go into the literature, a Google Scholar, this is what you see, well, this is actually uh, the truth, right? So you can get quite a biased picture, and this is clarifies why it's so important to do a research, replication research, and publish that research. And so more generally, um, yeah, does this sequence look random to you? Um, <coughs> It turns out that 65% of the people say, no, this is not random. I see certain patterns. For example, among the first eight, there might be six axes. Uh, in reality, however, uh, this sequence has all properties of randomness. There are an equal number of X's and O's, equal numbers of, of switches, and so on. Uh, but people like to see patterns. Uh, people here like to see a face, or they tend to see a face in the rock, even though there's no face. Uh, so this is a bit of a, of a careful reminder that people are apparently are less good in admitting that there is nothing as compared to seeing patterns in, in their data. Um, what I just said also has some implications for completely other fields. If you think about the legal uh, domain, for example, as I suppose um, we, we have a DNA test uh, and it gives a false match 
in 0.0001, so 0.01% of the cases, a false positive. If you then test 20,000 people, uh, there will probably be a, a match, right? Even if there's uh, completely random people, so a false positive. And so if you then go to the judge and say, hey, I have a match, but you don't tell the full story that you tested 20,000 people, uh, you can get problems. And this is also similar issues happened with some famous cases where people were convicted because of statistical evidence. Uh, so if you don't present the full story, you can get bi a biased picture of, uh, of reality. So, so far I've now illustrated yeah, why it's important to do replication research. Are there any questions about uh, things I've uh, told so far? <laughs> okay. Um, I would like to continue about the replication project. Um, I've mentioned Eckhart Hess, and his work actually had a quite a large impact. Yeah, so if you, not, not, not only science, yeah, so his work is quite highly cited. Everybody com will come across his work if you're interested in eyes or pupils. Also in marketing, yeah, Hess was actually active himself, is also in marketing. In popular press, yeah, so these are some uh, news items we picked up which are based on Hess' work. There are many more, uh, not only in the 1960s, 70s, but even today, you might find newspaper articles, like popular uh, articles, which even refer to Hess's work. Uh, but also in common view, eh? people tend to believe that there is something there in the pupil. Uh, is it really true? Um, so we thought we need to replicate that. Uh, actually, more precisely, we made a distinction between uh, reproduction, uh, which you call type 1 uh, replication, and uh, replication. As a reproduction uh, means can be used the raw data of Hess and recover the findings which are in his papers. Uh, why is that useful? We might discover, for example, mistakes in his analysis. Uh, we might discover certain forms of bias uh, in his analysis. Uh, maybe he rounded p-values differently or something. And we did replication. Uh, so Hess did his work with very small sample sizes, sometimes even smaller than 10. We thought we need to use large samples. We need to use also better equipment. Uh, so has used a slide projector for presenting images. We thought we need to use a modern eye tracker, which can record very accurately. We need to carefully control for luminance. And we also applied another technique called pre-registration. Um, so for one of our experiments, we, uh, our series of experiments, we said exactly what we're going to do, what kind of statistical tests we're doing. And we published that on the internet via the open science framework so that we prevent ourselves from doing this exploratory research, which I cautioned uh, about, right? So to be also to be fully uh, transparent. Well, about reproduction. Um, Dimitri actually visited an archive in Ohio, Ohio uh, two times for quite a period, I think two times uh, more than a week, <laughs> to go through an extensive archive of uh, the works of uh, Hess. So here there are 48 boxes full of notes, uh, slides, uh, personal uh, letters, you name it. Um, preserved as has originally delivered. So we went through this data to look up, uh, focusing especially on this 1960 work. Uh, we couldn't do everything, it's too overwhelming amount of information, but we focused especially on this 1960 paper. But we're still in the process of analyzing all this, but I would like to share a few findings. Uh, so if you remember uh, these five pictures, the nude lady, the baby, mother and baby, with the gender differences, um, it turned out, actually, that these five pictures were part of a larger series of 30 pictures. Here I show 15 of them. The other 15 were like commercial oriented, like uh, uh, commercials with uh, babies and soap and so on. Um, so we have a big question, like why did Hess present these five pictures, results for five pictures, and not all pictures? All right, so this relates very much to this possibly selective presentation. Presumably also the effects were strongest for these uh, five uh, slides he showed. Another thing we found, uh, which um, was actually, uh, it was sort of known, if you re read the literature carefully, but it was actually much bigger uh, compared to what we could expect, that Hess was, ha had a sort of second life in a sense. He was very active working for marketing agencies and selling his technique. He said, hey, I can predict, this is a letter which Hess sent to uh, to, uh, to Playboy magazine, actually, he said, I can predict which uh, playmate in the next month will give you the most sales, right? So this, there's a whole bunch of reports and letters like this in the archive. Um, so this is very interesting, which we still try to interpret this to its uh, fullest. A third thing we found is um, we looked at the raw data. 
So this is what you, um, yeah, how it looked like, handwritten notes, a few parameters, two times per second, carefully uh, recorded by an assistant. So we typed in all those numbers, it was over 10,000 numbers, and uh, yeah, we created some of his Hess's graphs. So Hess used a slide projector, and s one th few things we found is that uh, you see this quite big drop, and here it increases again. So that has to do with the slide change. Uh, so if you change slides, it becomes black for a short period, and then you get light. Uh, so that's what you see here, but this effect is actually 10 to 20 percent. Uh, so we thought we need to better understand it, so we got the same projector, same brand of projector, same type projector, and we did all kinds of measurements with high-speed cameras and so on to see how a slide change actually worked, how long it is dark, and we did some pupil measurements ourselves uh, with image recognition and so on, so indeed we could confirm that this drop is indeed due to the slide change. Uh, so this sort of invalidates the use of a slide projector which he used in all his uh, research. Although I should ad admit that Hess, as we also discovered, chopped off the first and last second. So he was aware of that problem, but it was not reported as such uh, in the papers. Um, well, moving on to replication. So we did actually two big experiments, uh, totaling over 300 participants uh, with this modern eye tracking equipment. Uh, it's very accurate, actually. So we did this with uh, students with the same age, sort of, and same gender ratio as Hess's uh, work. Uh, also approved by the TU Delft Ethics uh, Committee, this research. So what did we do? Um, well, first we re replicated this 1960s study. Uh, highly cited, as I mentioned. And what has found is that well, there are very clear gender differences. Yeah? So if a female is looking at a baby, the pupils of the uh, female dilate. If the males look at a nude female, the pupils of the male dilate. Second study. Uh, this is about calculations. Well, I've already explained also highly cited, only five participants, by the way, that the pupil dilates when doing calculations. But in this paper, it's a bit technical, but it has shown that the, pupil, uh, the maximum pupil dil the diameter dilates uh, as a function of the difficulty of the calculation, uh, while we used an average. Uh, so the, um, we will look into this. Can we use exactly the same equations and find the same percentages as has found? Um, Third study has said, well, the pupils have a role in communication. And so suppose I'm looking at pupils uh, and they become larger, uh, your pupils also become larger. And so what Hess did is he showed schematic eyes of different uh, pairs. And he said, well, if there are two schematic eyes, uh, then the observer's pupil become larger if the pupil in the schematic eyes also becomes larger. But if it's only one eye, or free eyes, that it's unnatural, then we don't see that. Yeah, so he says this is sort of innate, biologically primed behavior, which we only see for two eyes. So I thought this is really interesting if this is true, so let's replicate that. Well, a third one, fourth one, a bit more obscure one, uh, this is actually in uh, marketing, uh, where Hess um, yeah, wanted to predict whether a certain TV series would sell or have lots of views based on pupil diameter measurements. Uh, so in this series, uh, this is about a Western, a man escapes from a crowd, and it turns out that um, if the man tries to escape, the males get happy, so we see dilated pupils of males, and at one point he is caught, that happens here, uh, then the females become happy. Uh, so that is, he even himself called it a bit crazy, but he thought this is still pretty interesting also to see how videos work, um, so let's replicate this as well. And a fifth study, um, <coughs> visually presented words. Uh, so Hess said, uh, I believe that, uh, for example, the word nude or flay, which can be uh, characterized as arousing words, give uh, dilation of the pupil compared to other words. So he thought this is ridiculous, you're never going to find this, but we need to still replicate this. Um, so, study one. Uh, these are pictures we showed. We went to the archive and these are uh, Slides we also found in a presentation of Hess. Uh, probably he didn't use exactly these ones, but that's a bit of a different story. We thought you can always argue that 60 years ago uh, people felt a bit different, so we thought we need to also include a modern equivalent also to get a second uh, measurement. So all slides were sh or stimuli were shown for 10 seconds, and before each stimulus we showed a control slide, uh, very much the same as Hess used, with numbers on it. So here you see uh, recordings we did with eye tracking. Uh, so, uh, Eye tracking consists of fixates, fixations and saccades, rapid eye movements uh, uh, and fixate, fixations. 
also shown for 10 seconds. So we calculated the percentage change of pupil diameter between the stimulus slide and the preceding control slide in all cases, just like Hess did. Well, here you see the results. This is for the images. Um, this is the elapsed time. This is the control slide. Uh, so we see a bit of reflex, recovery, and here are the new images presented. And well, first of all, even though we carefully controlled for luminance, uh, everything exactly the same luminance and standard deviation of luminance, we see a big reflex. So the pupil tends to constrict uh, and then re dilates. And we also see that this is kind of stimulus specific. Uh, so the green lines, like the male pictures, show a sort of similar pattern. Um, okay, th so this is what you, what you then get. And now testing the actual hypothesis, this is a whole bunch of statistics, but it shows the percentage of pupil diameter change, as I just explained, for stimulus slide versus control between males and females. Well, um, what we find is that uh, for the female, one of the female pictures, uh, we do find a result in agreement with Hess. Uh, so um, the pupils of males were actually relatively bigger compared to the pupils of um, uh, females. However, for one other picture, we found also a statistically significant effect, but it was in the opposite direction as has um, yeah, stated. Uh, so overall, we cannot really do much with it. We also zoomed in on one of these significant effects. Um, it's actually quite complicated because if you look at the diameter of females, it's actually already bigger during the control slide. Uh, so actually males showed a smaller drop rather than actual dilation, right? So the interpretation is also quite difficult. It depends on how you look at it. What we did find, however, is that uh, there were quite some differences in looking behavior. Uh, so males were considerably more likely to look at the breast of the female, and this effect was actually larger, or yet equally as large at least, as the effect we found in observed in pupil diameters. And also in both pictures it was uh, a similar effect. <coughs> um, well, I just showed this reflex, right? Um, the dilation, so we thought we need to control even better for luminance. Uh, so we did some brainstorming. I thought, yeah, um, we, ha we have to do something here. In a second experiment, we decided to use line drawings. Uh, so we convey the meaning of the picture, and we follow up a recommendation for the literature to, to keep luminance exactly constant, but still show, show a picture. Uh, so the same five themes, but now in more abstract form. Well, here you see the results. This is, again, the control slide, and this is the stimulus slide. Well, there is actually quite an effect um, that apparently the pupils dilate when looking at a nude picture, even though it's just a bunch of lines. Uh, so for these four pictures, nude male, uh, nude female, we find a dilation, and for the others, uh, not really. However, uh, actually the effect was also quite, uh, quite reasonably strong. Uh, so these are results for all individuals. It shows the mean pupil diameter change for those four pictures compared to the mean pupil diameter change for the other six pictures and almost everybody is below the diagonal line, right? So this effect holds for yeah, almost all people, you could say. Um, looking at gender differences, what this was really about, uh, here there was nothing uh, significant. Uh, so people get excited, apparently, for any new picture, not necessarily a picture of the opposite uh, gender. <coughs> and again, even though it's an abstract picture, we replicated this uh, looking behavior difference. Going to the calculations, uh, so we used the calculations used by Hess, plus eight additional ones. Um, and we thought, well, the more difficult calculation gives a larger dilation. In this graph, uh, so here you see the recovery from the previous slide, and here you see the calculation. Uh, it turns out, as uh, so lighter lines represent easier calculations as defined by the solving time and the error rate, uh, that the easier calculations actually give a larger dilation than the more difficult ones. Well, how can this be explained? Um, well, it depends a bit how you're looking at the data. It might become a bit technical, but the maximum diameter is actually increasing for the more difficult calculations. Uh, but the pupil diameter at a given moment in time, let's say three seconds since presentation, is actually larger for the easier calculations. Uh, so by means of this, we came up with a refinement. It really depends on how you look at the data. And strictly speaking, Hess was wrong. Uh, but the main finding is that, of course, more difficult calculations take longer to solve. Uh, so uh, if, if you've solved it, the pupil drops again. Uh, so it depends really a lot on which measure you use, and you should be precise in that. Um, I'm not talking about the schematic pupils. Uh, so we showed nine, just like Hess. Uh, we, we, we draw them, same uh, line thickness, and so on. 
Uh, here you see the results. It looks a bit like a mess. The effects were quite small. But again, we calculated the pupil diameter change for stimulus relative to control. And here you see the results. Uh, so in all cases, uh, the pupil diameter change was larger when the pupil in the picture was also larger. But has said, I will find this only for two pupils. We found the significant effect actually only for one pupil. And we think this is because there's simply more black in the picture, right? Even though it's a very small effect, um, yeah, if, if you're looking at something black, uh, the pupil starts to dilate. Uh, so we also found quite strong differences in looking behavior. So this is the cumulative number of saccades. So saccades are rapid eye movements. Uh, so for um, the one eye, one eye uh, stimuli, which are the gray lines, which you see here, people just looked at that pupil. Uh, for two and three, they continuously scanned back and forth. Uh, so there were major differences in looking behavior, which could probably account for these, uh, these differences. <laughs> What you saw here is an overlay, so each person is one marker. Uh, so you can see the enormous power that eye trackers have. Huh? If a person turns his head uh, and turns uh, object to some, somebody else, uh, the eyes of the people also go to that, that direction. Um, <coughs> but it was about pupil diameter, not about where people look necessarily. And here we see, uh, this is the control slide, and here we see uh, what happens during the video. So we see a big dilation and all kinds of fluctuations. Um, uh, so it, which are almost the same for males and females. Uh, so we might find some support for HES here, but overall a really complex um, pattern. And we're doing analysis now, and it turns out that uh, the local luminance, uh, so if you're looking at, for example, this torch, which is a bit bright, uh, that it gives rise to a small dilation. But we also suspect, or it could be the case, that some of these peaks might also have to do with uh, momentary suspense, like a small bang or something that could also cause a dilation. Um, and so videos are really tricky for this type of research. Finally, words. And so we used has original words. In addition, we selected eight additional words. Um, scores from the literature uh, rated low on, uh, and high on valence and arousal. And so we used two words for each category. And for example, the word fragment is a really boring word, right? <laughs> uh, other words might be regarded as more arousing or more pleasurable. So here you see the results. Uh, in short, we did confirm uh, quite clearly actually that the word nude gives a uh, quite strong dilation compared to the more neutral words. Um, yeah. Final thing we did, uh, we also controlled carefully for luminance. Uh, we, we checked the effects of luminance, so we made the screen white to black and back. And you can see that um, yeah, the brightness of the screen can evoke pupil diameters of minus 30 up to plus 30 uh, percent. Uh, so this reinforces the message that you really need to be careful with luminance if you do any pupil diameter measurements. All right, um, some concluding remarks. And uh, more general to answer this specific question where I started with. Well, I do think that there's lots of information in the eyes. Uh, so in the video we saw that uh, eyes direct attention to a specific uh, topic of interest. Cognitive activity, yes, if you're stressed or doing something difficult, the pupils dilate. Arousal, yes, even though it's just a line drawing. But things like valence and interest, um, maybe not, right? So that is the harder part. So we're still trying to interpret all this and, um, yeah, in terms of Hess's work. 
uh, we, we don't want to say immediately that his work failed to replicate, actually because some things did replicate. Uh, he got things right even though he did use a slide projector in a very small number of subjects. So maybe he got them right for the wrong reasons. Uh, so we're still trying to, to assess this. Well, if there's time, I don't know, I also have a few recommendations, which I often tell the students, like how can you avoid false positives? Uh, so this is, in the end, I think what we all try to prevent. Well, one thing, um, before you do the research, try to improve your understanding of the R value. Uh, so how plausible is the hypothesis that I'm actually testing? Uh, so you can assess it by means of a literature review. Also, if you find something su surprising, uh, uh, don't shout, I have a breakthrough it actually might be more likely that this surprising finding uh, means that your research was not good, <laughs> right? So this is um, one. Second, uh, yeah, the research design should be free of bias as much as possible. Um, do not chase statistical significance, uh, so don't go run after this P is uh, smaller than 0, 0, 5. Do not confuse exploratory uh, with confirmatory results. Uh, so just exploring a big data set and then saying I have a significant effect, that's pretty dangerous. Uh, of course, you can do exploratory research, but you should carefully disclose it, like I did exploratory research, I looked at this many things. Um, well, something we did uh, for the first time is to register the study and hypothesis on the internet before actually doing those analysis. Uh, so that is a very good, uh, it actually helped us a lot. Uh, because it saved us also much time uh, afterwards, because we did all our homework, we knew what to look for, and so in the end, writing of the paper is actually much easier, so that, that's also a second advantage. Um, but do not use fancy or flexible methods. Uh, so I work at the TU Delft, and I noticed that many engineering students are actually quite good in using all kinds of fancy mat methods, with MATLAB, for example, they might uh, install a neural net, uh, get a sophisticated regression analysis working, uh, that's all fine, but uh, these methods also usually have flexibility, right? So that these might make it more likely that you find something significant. So that's also why we used very basic t-tests in everything I just uh, showed. Large sample sizes, as I've explained, um, avoiding publication bias. So I think TU Delft does it in a really right way, for example, to put all master theses online on the repository. Uh, provide details. Uh, so what we do often is to uh, not only publish the paper, but also the scripts and raw data so that others can reproduce your work. And many of these things can also be prevented by encouraging a critical discussion with peers. Um, yeah, final word also to, uh, for example, the um, 40U, uh, which is what we often use, the 40U Center for Research Data. So I think the 40U is really doing uh, well. So here we upload our uh, raw data often and also our scripts. Uh, which is, by the way, also free. Uh, so I think in other universities you might have to look up something and pay for it, but the Delft is really uh, ahead, I think, of other universities in a way uh, in encouraging uh, transparency uh, in this way. All right, so this concludes uh, my talk. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there any questions? Yeah, you have a question. Yeah. Is it on? Yes. Thanks for a really nice talk. I have one question. So um, the graphs were lines, and then error bars become a bit tricky. But when I see a student in a group present the graph without error bars, they have to point them out on the screen because it's always a statistical representation of data, whether it's in triplicate or whether it's a big data set. Um, the original data from Hess was like 10 or so. How do you feel about getting those? Um, in the get, getting information across in a visual way. Uh, yeah, so we, we uh, I presented the results in two ways, as averages across time, uh, no error bars because then it would be uh, 30 lines instead of 10 lines. Um, uh, averages across the whole period, uh, right? Um, and uh, tables, so in the tables I showed the standard deviations with the means. Um, so I think we should uh, definitely show the variance, but figures are not an ideal way if you have many conditions. Right? That's why we did it like this. But we also plan to publish all raw data with the paper. <laughs> so um, maybe um, I can actually go back to one of the slides in order to um, maybe uh, get more precise um, answer. Uh, but here we show the mean and standard deviation, which this, so this is refers to the individual differences, the magnitude of the individual differences. 
Does this answer your question? Uh, or did yeah, you mean something? I, I felt curious because in many, I come from a physical biotechnology background and there it's really common to describe your error bars and I didn't see them in many of the graphs. So I was curious what the underlying reason was. Okay, uh, mostly to get a certain message across. Uh, so here we have, uh, so I just said that this result is statistically significant, right? So here you see the means and uh, standard deviations. So that's a measure of individual differences and effect size. And now I said, well, let's zoom in and how, how does this effect look uh, over time? Uh, I could just as well plot the error bars around this. Um, so this would, would be feasible here, but it was not feasible on this graph because then it would be a bit of a mess. Uh, so it's, this is like the global picture. And then in the tables, we give effect sizes and, and, and spread among, between uh, people. Yeah. So in some cases, trends might just be an artifact rather than... Yeah, yeah absolutely, trend. absolutely, yeah. Uh, for example, in the, the, the fact that... Um, well, <coughs> I also have, of course, this graph. So in, in the full paper, we try to report everything. Uh, but this was an illustration of it. Uh, so here you see all individuals. Uh, so most are, are below the line. So this must be a significant effect, if you know what I mean. Uh, so here you can see everything, basically. Just to illustrate that the effect was quite, uh, quite robust in this case. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. There was a question there in the back. <coughs> Um, I was in some of the differences you might find between the five different studies are in particularly in westerns how somebody in the 1960s might perceive a western is very different to how somebody yeah. in 2000 almost 2020 perceives a western because now it seems seems a bit cliched so I'm wondering if those the cultural aspect of the uh, film but maybe all the also the images as well played a part in how you did your research yeah so the film was a bit of an, of an extra, <laughs> but uh, indeed. Uh, so we tried, that's actually a very good point because uh, uh, NVO and others say you have to do direct lab replication, right? Uh, only that is valuable if you start to do all kinds of different things, might be less valuable. Um, so th th this is a large point of discussion also in our research team, like how are we going to do this? Are we going to use their stimuli? Are we going to use some extra stimuli as we did? Or are we going to test actually completely new hypothesis, but I recognize your point a lot. Actually also this research, there are also many other studies which say it depends on whether you ask people to reflect on the images uh, or not. The degree of explicitness, like how much nudeness do you show, for example, is there sound in addition? Um, yeah, so this is really also a sort of hidden moderator it's called, so you can always bring up extra arguments. But this is a very good point, which I think we haven't fully solved yet, but I fully uh, recognize it. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well done. Um, thank you for the story. Let's start with that. I was triggered by the fact that you have pre-registered the study. Yeah. Um, I think that's a very good idea, but I'd like to promote that idea, so I'd like to hear your experiences in a bit more detail. Did it take you a lot of time? Did it lead to a discussion? Did you get any feedback from others? Um, yeah, I can explain. So we were, uh, actually it took us lots, lots of time, much more than expected, because it also turns out that if you want to be really precise in the hypothesis you're documenting, you also need to read the paper really carefully and um, so it actually took us many weeks to, to get this pre-registration document online, including the code, right? So we also published like the scripts, which are hundreds of lines of code, not hundreds of lines actually, I should say, maybe 100 or 200. But um, yeah, that took us maybe a whole month to, to set that all, uh, all up. Um, it's the first time we did that, uh, but now that you're writing the paper, um, it turns out that much of the work has actually been done. And we, we cannot speculate anymore, like what are we going to do exactly, what's the best way to test it, because we already documented it, right? So now we're actually saving lots of time uh, in, in that way. Uh, I think not many, many people read the pre-registration document, it's just on the internet, it has a digital object identifier, but I'm not sure that uh, we didn't get any feedback uh, on it. Um, but it's also somehow re re uh, assuring that you know exactly, uh, we said exactly we're going to look from this second to this second, we're going to divide this number by this number, going to do this statistical test and this statistical test. Um, yeah, so we just do it. And the rest we report as extra. Uh, so we did some extra analysis, like the luminance in the movie, for example. 
Uh, so you can say, uh, in addition, we did uh, exploratory or clarifying analysis. But having done this, I would really recommend it, actually. It was, uh, uh, yeah, quite good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the very back. <laughs> yeah, you need to you need to use this because it is. Yeah, you need. Yeah, yeah, but it it is recorded. <laughs> Are you recording? <laughs> yes. What an honor! And it will be used against you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyhow, I want to really stress what I said because I, I got some nice colleagues here also attended together a course of public speaking at the teaching academy here, which was really, really good for us, talking in public. Um, but this is not relevant. Uh, one question. Was your presentation really about reading ab emotions? Because you've been talking about cognitive activity, uh, attention, maybe arousal, but, but I really miss the emotions element. I mean, were people feeling emotion? Did they report emotions? when the pupils were opening and closing? Um, good question. Oh, this title was a bit of a catchy title, I must admit. No, okay, I fine, but still, still, <laughs> still I, didn't, it's interesting. I didn't even make her I, I don't, I don't mind that, uh, <laughs> but still, I think. Um, it's yeah, that's a good question. We also thought, uh, should we ask questions afterwards, like how did you feel about this specific type of stimulus? Yeah. Um, we could have also asked uh, sexual orientation of the participants to get more detail. Uh, actually thought about lots of things. Uh, but we try to keep it a bit clean uh, in that sense. Um, yeah, also this dilemma between direct replication and conceptual replication, right? So we actually do already lots of extra things. We measure eye movements. Um, we have extra stimuli. Uh, we did ask um, things like coffee and alcohol consumption and uh, some basic variables. Uh, maybe we should have done it, but we didn't. Uh, so we really looked at can we replicate these numbers mm -hmm. using the same method as described in the paper. Yeah, uh, okay, but there are, there are tons of moderators, uh, which we <laughs> so actually, yeah. For example, some papers say that the, the, the degree of explicitness of the stimulus matters a lot. Uh, others say don't. Uh, it doesn't matter that much. Have uh, you also, also affected line drawings? Uh, so. Um, there are still many, many questions to ask. Uh, so yeah. this is also a bit what is replication, I think, about direct replication. We can just answer, um, yeah, if we use the same methods, do we get the same results? Uh, but it also brings up lots of new questions, uh, I would say. Okay, fine. Um. Okay, there's room for a last question. Yeah, otherwise I, I have also a question. So in the beginning you started with this, uh, interview with uh, Robert Dijkgraaf, yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, well, there is a question if social sciences are harder than uh, exact sciences, but the question below that is, of course, is data playing another role in social sciences than in exact sciences? And I was triggered because I'm now chairing a committee to find a new professor for discrete mathematics, and they are, all the candidates that came there were extremely eager to find theorems and using all kinds of big data just to, to get uh, yeah, at least a, a feeling where new theorems might be and a way how to prove them. Is there still in this time of big data a difference between the social sciences and the exact sciences? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, as I just explained, things like statistics as I showed here, yeah. right? are, I think, uh, very popular in the medical and behavioral sciences. Yeah. Uh, but, of course, other types of data, if you look at uh, our section, uh, intelligent vehicles, yeah. uh, they also use data, but from camera images, people are working at facial recognition. Um, yeah, uh, I think the difference here is that uh, in some other fields, as Robert Dijkhoff also said, we can do maybe billions of measurements, right? Yeah. <laughs> And here we're usually limited. We now have 300, uh, but still some effects might not be perfectly clear. If you would have had 1,000, <laughs> yeah. it would have been better. Uh, so the resources, uh, you cannot easily test a thousand of participants in the lab. It's, I think, one, uh, one big difference. Uh, but of course, all the principles of the central limit theorem and uh, confidence intervals are very much uh, the yeah. same. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we should uh, applaud. Yeah, so I want to uh, conclude with, with one remark that I really want to tell. So we had uh, several PhDs already that uh, 
that were making fraud with their data. So there's a lot of pressure now on uh, people that you work with data to find something in the data. Yeah, and um, and I was talking also with several PhDs from also from abroad and that have a fixed time here and that have uh, say funding from their home country, but also with Dutch PhDs and other researchers, and there is a big pressure on them yeah, to, to find something. And if there is this pressure, and that is also the case with, with some students, then there is always a danger that you go over a line. And for the, say, for the teachers, for the staff, there is a responsibility to, to check. Yeah, and we had one of our professors, and uh, that was amazing, he was looking and was talking with the PhD one time and then he really saw there must be something wrong and then he said, give me all the data, give me all the input, give me everything. And then he checked and there was indeed fraud. And yeah, I would really yeah, plead to point your attention to this yeah, because on the long term, you see, Mr. Hess, a long time ago, yeah, there will be new researchers and uh, new data and yeah, they will find out. You have a last question or you just want to applaud? It will only work if we stop producing postdoc code. Yeah. Because it's, it's unreadable, so it's nice if people share their code, but if our researchers are trained and um, it's not weird that we train them to not write good code because we're not training to be professional yep. software developers. So we should have them be assisted with people that actually help them write code, readable, reproducible, in runtime environments that are reproducible. Because otherwise, I'm not going to redo four years of my PhD's work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, then we close the session. Uh, this is wise words. Thanks for that really inspiring remarks at the very end, and it's good because we have uh, Lotta Mellenhorst, who is part of the integrity board with us, so I think that's also part of the bigger strategy we have at the university. And also I know there are some colleagues from the library and also from different faculties who will be looking at rewards and recognition that NVO is also leading the way in here, so hopefully there will be less of perverse metrics for researchers and more uh, evaluation based on how reproducible that research is. So hopefully that's something to look out for the future. And I would like to thank you again, all of you, for attending that session today. Joost for giving the wonderful talk. Carlin for joining us with the welcome remark. Again, Hans, you for chairing the Q&A session. And I would like to invite you for drinks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>